Pressure on community organisations. Thank you, Senator Askew. The time for this debate has now expired. We'll move to question time. Senator Hume. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Like my colleagues, I've been speaking to businesses across this Australia about their experience of Labor's cost of living crisis on them and on their operations. Now, one business owner told me that the cost of supplies was increasing 30 per cent week on week. Minister, what is this Labor government doing to alleviate this inflation on small businesses? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, that Order. there will be hyperinflation? Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I welcome the opportunity uh, to talk about Labor's economic plan to address the cost of living yeah, crisis yeah. that we inherited yeah, yeah. from a government that had wasted a decade that had not dealt with the policy challenges, that they had their head in the sand and used the budget like it was uh, money made available for the National Party. That's, right. That's what we are fixing, and we accept that businesses are under a lot of pressure. They haven't had an energy policy for the last 10 years. That's right. 22 failed policies <laughs> under your government when you were in power. That's what small business is saying to us. Yes, there are challenges, but we need to deal with them, and Labor's economic plan does exactly that. And in terms of dealing with the cost of living crisis, we have made submissions to the Fair Work Commission to make sure that, that working people, those on the minimum wage, actually get a decent pay rise. We have extended some of the pandemic payments that your mob had ended or are going to end, and we have kept them going. We will debate in this week the uh, climate change bill to put in place the regulatory and legislative framework uh, Minister, to deal with your the seat. impacts. Uh, uh, just a moment, Senator Hume. I'm running the Senate, thank you, and I will call senators when I'm good and ready. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. Point of, point of order. A minute into a two-minute answer, and the minister hasn't answered a question about the, the effects of inflation on small businesses, <coughs> and specifically about the potential for hyperinflation. Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. I believe Senator Gallagher is being relevant. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And, and in, in response to the second part, the uh, forecasts for inflation were detailed in the Treasurer's July update. Um, economic statement, but I am explaining to the Shadow Minister for Finance exactly what we are doing to put downward pressure on costs on businesses and households. I can go through it again. We've got childcare. We've got cheaper medicines right. coming in. We've got a bring forward of the training places to deal with the skills right. crisis that small business are also discussing oh, with us after me. years of not dealing with workforce shortages and the skills training to make sure that young people and older workers actually have the skills that they need for the jobs of the future. They're just some of the things that we've done in three months, as opposed to your nine years of inaction. Right. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Before I call Senator Hume, I remind those on my right that Senator Hume has the right to put her question in silence. I struggle to hear her question. Senator Hume, uh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I remind the minister that, in fact, childcare, COVID payments and minimum wages are doing nothing to help small business inflation. Another small business owner told me that she had begun absorbing fixed costs because of, with the other cost of living pressures, she didn't think that customers would be able to afford any additional price increases. So, Minister, what do you have to tell this business that will assist them in making sure that they can stay open and that they can stay profitable? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, that there will be more strikes? Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. Minister. As the Prime Minister has said, this government is pro-business. We are pro-working with business to deal with the challenges that they are Order. dealing with right now after uh, a Minister, decade of a— Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President. After dealing with a decade of wasted opportunity and inaction by those opposite that have the nerve to come in here now and start blaming us for the economic uh, challenges that we have inherited. These didn't happen overnight. They didn't happen on the 21st of May. They've been brewing for years. Skills, climate change, energy policy, 
dealing with the challenges in visa backlogs, in migration, all of the issues that we are responding Order. to now after your Order. government had its head in the sand because you were too busy fighting each other or throwing dodgy Senator cash McGrath. for the National Party. Thank you, Ministers. Um, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam President. I've also had a small business, in fact, more than one, tell me that they're currently working through plans to lower hours, to lower hours for staff in expectation of an economic downturn. What does this minister have to tell these businesses who, say, who see no plan from this government? And does she agree? And does she agree with her colleague, the Assistant Treasurer, who said that under a Labor government there would be a very rocky economic period? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. Well, I can assure uh, the Shadow Finance Minister that we will be working closely with small business. They were at the table at the Jobs and Skills Summit. They were deeply involved in the discussions through their peak organisations. Uh, please resume your seat. Thank you, Minister. Um, President, we were working with small business and their industry representatives, and they were uh, business was very well represented at the Jobs Senator and Hughes. Skills Summit. So we will be dealing with the things that they want to see dealt with, like skills, like increasing the uh, migration numbers, like dealing with climate change, like putting in place an energy policy by supporting them in terms of uh, some of the challenges around cyber and digital. These are all the issues that we're looking with, and we want to ensure that people using their businesses have enough money in their pocket to go and spend in those businesses, and that's why we are supporting reasonable and responsible wage increases for working people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the outcomes of last week's Jobs and Skills Summit and how those outcomes will benefit Australians? Minister. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I thank Senator Smith Senator uh, for the question and for her um, all the work that she did in the lead up to the Jobs and Skills Summit. Right across our, um, the government, our caucus, more than 100 roundtables were held uh, in various locations. I did one with Senator Urquhart in, her, in, her, uh, in northern Tasmania to listen, very well represented, more than more than 70 people, businesses, NGOs, everyone coming together to work with us to talk about the challenges that they want to see. The summit brought people together uh, to agree key actions to build the stronger economy that we all want to see and help set a clear direction for future work. Putting full employment and productivity, remember that word productivity, you didn't see much of it, did you, when you were in, in government, at the centre of our economic strategy and recognising that equal participation and opportunities for women are critical to that. We agreed 36 immediate initiatives, including extra money for fee-free TAFE and fast-tracking of those fee-free places, more and better investment in social and affordable housing, an extra $4,000 income credit so aged pensioners can work more and earn more before it affects their pension, responsibly increasing the mi permanent migration target to address those crippling um, labour shortages that small business is telling us about, beginning the work to repair the broken bargaining system and strengthening flexible working arrangements. After a decade of division and delay, conflict and complacency, this is what can be achieved by a government that is inclusive, collaborative and consensus-seeking. By refusing to participate, not one of you, not one of you attended. Mr Little Proud did, Senator all credit Hughes. to him. It's clear that the opposition wants nothing but a decade of flat real wages, Thank falling you, productivity Gallagher. and falling Your living standards. Senator, Senator McGrath, Senator Marielle Smith, first supplementary. Can the minister outline the areas of policy that were discussed at the Jobs and Skills Summit and update the Senate on where there was broad agreement among those who were represented at the summit? Minister. I will, and I can tell you from being in that summit for two days how many people spoke to me about the Order. environment. Sorry. Order. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. 
I can't tell you how many people who attended the summit came up to me and said how refreshing it was that they had a government who was prepared to sit down with them for two days and talk to them about all of the issues affecting them. It was a broad range of people right across the community, and they wanted a better skilled and better trained workforce, addressing skill shortages and strengthening the migration system, boosting job security and wages, promoting equal opportunities and reducing barriers to employment, and maximising jobs and opportunities in our industry and our community. This is what the summit determined to be the priorities, as was making gender equality a core economic priority. There yeah. were significant yeah. agreements reached. It's yeah. shame yeah. those opposite couldn't be bothered coming. Yeah. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister explain what progress was made at the Jobs and Skills Summit on restoring national leadership on gender equality? Minister. Thank you. I can. And this was a very serious um, part of the summit. It was kicked off by an all-women panel on equal opportunity and pay in a room where women made up a majority of participants. At the 1983 Economic Summit, there was only one woman in the room, Labor Senator Susan Ryan. But we know that women's equality is good economic policy, something that was recognised unanimously at the Jobs and Skills Summit. We also talked about our $5 billion commitment to make childcare cheaper for more Australian parents and allow more women to work more hours if they wished. Um, we, we talked about, we announced the chair of the Women's Economic Equality Task Force, uh, Sam Mostyn, to maintain momentum on the ideas raised at the summit and advise the government on the national gender equality strategy. And I said, and I committed to as Minister for the Public Service, to expect that the APS should take a leadership position on gender equality, including through reporting to WGIA, setting targets to ad address gender equality and gathering data you, on how Your to make flexible work. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Why is the Albanese government entertaining the proposal of the Australian Council of Trade Unions to reintroduce industry-wide bargaining? Does the minister realise that industry-wide bargaining will lead to more strikes and significantly disrupt a number of sectors of our economy? Good Thank you, President. Senator Cash, Minister. Thank you, President. Well, isn't it disappointing, President, that the only group in Australian politics who hasn't got the memo that what the Australian people want is more cooperation is the Liberal Party? Even the National Party seemed to briefly get the memo when they had their leader turn up to the Jobs and Skills Summit. But of course, Order. the leader of the opposition didn't turn up. The shadow treasurer wanted to be invited and then didn't show up. The deputy Minister leader. Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you. As I say, President, it's very disappointing that the uh, the Liberal Party does not has not received the memo because. What the Australian people have been saying over and over again, both before and since the election, is what they want in industrial relations is more agreements and less conflict. But what do we continue to see offered up by the opposition, who are still fighting the last war? They want to progress the nine years Senator that we McGrath. saw of more conflict, less agreements, lower Senator wages McGrath. and lower productivity. What a quadrilla that is. If you could go to the races and make a bet on a quadrilla and you were a member of the opposition, you would want more conflict, less agreement, lower wages and lower productivity. That is what you bequeathed the Australian people and that is what you continue to want to offer the Australian people. Now, in terms of uh, wage bargaining, the Albanese Labor government has made a very clear commitment that we will get wages moving in this country. And the way we are going to do that is by reaching more agreements. Business and unions agree that we need a new approach. That's why so many of them actually turned up to the summit, unlike anyone up until about that row last week, uh, Minister, uh, to actually well, have a discussion. Please resume your seat. Uh, those on my left particularly, and some senators in particular, Senator Hughes and McGrath, the running commentary is absolutely disorderly, and I would have asked you to desist. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, President. So we will uh, legislate to ensure that workers and businesses have flexible options for reaching agreements, and that is all about bringing the current legislation up to date with a new government that wants to get wages moving. Now, 
Senator Cash referenced the ACTU. Of course, the ACTU aren't the only people to welcome this approach. I heard Alexi Boyd from Cosboa this morning on the radio. What we are hearing from our members is some of them are saying this is something they would like it like to look into. Thank you, it's Minister as simple White. as that. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. A supplementary question. Will the minister guarantee that any changes the Albanese government makes to the Fair Work Act will not result in more strike action being taken. Thank you, Senator Cash, Minister. Thank you, President. Well, as I say, this change, which has been agreed upon by businesses and unions at the summit, is uh, about better pay for workers, particularly for women. It's about more productivity in the economy, not less. It's about more agreements rather than continuation of the nine years of conflict that we saw from the last uh, government Watt, that did nothing. Your seat. Senator McGrath, I did ask you during the last series of questions to not do the running commentary. I would ask you to stop doing the running commentary, please. Minister. Thank you, President. So what will change as a result of these legislative changes from this, business, this government is that more businesses will have access to simple, flexible and fair agreements and more workers will get pay rises. So as I say, that's why Alexi Boyd from Cosboa was on the radio this morning saying that what she's hearing from her members is that some of them say it's something that's worth looking into. Uh, unfortunately, the party that presents itself as being the friend of small business is actually running against small business and not listening to uh, small business. Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Point of order on question of direct relevance. Senator Cash's supplementary question went very specifically to the rates of strike action that could occur under government reforms, simply seeking a guarantee from Senator Watt that there would not be an increase in the incidence of strike action. He hasn't mentioned strike action once in his response. With 12 seconds remaining, President, I invite him to give that guarantee. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do believe the minister is being relevant, but I will listen over the next uh, 12 seconds. Minister. Thank you, President. Unfortunately, there remain in this uh, community and in this parliament some people who don't want workers to get pay rises, and there are some people who don't want businesses to have productivity, so that's why they keep using scare tactics about Thank strikes. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Does the minister agree with the assistant treasurer that striking is an effective part of the bargaining process? Why is the government promoting workplace conflict instead of employees and employers working together. Thank you, uh, Senator Cash, Minister. Well, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Cash. The minister responsible for more conflict in industrial relations than any we have seen in recent history, the minister whose office leaked a police raid on a union office, that's how much she was into conflict, and now she wants to come in and lecture us about strikes and Order. about industrial conflict. Order. I mean, really, really. Even for you, that is utterly shameless. Um, uh, everyone knows. Minister, please resume your seat. Please continue. Thank you, uh, President. And thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Cash. I, I welcome every question you ask about industrial relations. Now. I noticed that there was one member of the opposition who did have the decency to admit that his, uh, his government had been so failed, and that is the man who is now apparently known as Soccer Dad Matt Canavan, who on Twitter a couple of days ago said that when Australia became a nation in 1901, the average Australian had to work for 18 minutes to earn a loaf of bread. By 2019, that loaf cost just four minutes of work. Over the past three years, we have gone backwards. Thank you, Senator Canavan, for telling people that it now takes four minutes and 21 seconds Thank you, to Minister, earn your daily bread as a result of your expired. government. Senator Furuki. <clears throat> My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Minister, the recent climate fueled floods in Pakistan are having horrific consequences. To date, one third of Pakistan is underwater, 33 million affected. The death toll is more than a thousand people, one million homes have been wiped out, and half a million people are living in tents. This is the deadly face of the climate catastrophe. Early estimates show that the damage from the floods is more than $10 billion. The UN has called for $160 million in emergency aid. Australia has so far promised a measly $2 million in aid to Pakistan. Just $2 million. This is nowhere near our fair share. Minister, will the government take responsibility and provide more aid to Pakistan, commensurate with our wealth and contribution to the climate crisis, and equivalent to the scale of the disaster? Minister. 
Uh, thank you, President. And uh, I thank the Senator for her question. And uh, I also acknowledge her, uh, her and her family's personal um, connection with Pakistan, um, along with many others in the diaspora for whom this has been uh, a very difficult time. Um, uh, the, the Senator is right. Uh, this is a disaster on a truly massive scale. Uh, 33 million people affected, including through displacement and loss of livelihood. Uh, we've seen uh, lives lost, uh, including those of children. Uh, and on behalf of the Australian government, as I did last week, um, <clears throat> I extend uh, our sympathies and condolences to the families and communities in Pakistan that have lost loved ones and to the many who have been affected by the devastating floods. Um, we announced a contribution, as the senator has uh, indicated, uh, through the World Food Programme of $2 million to assist the Pakistani government and its people respond to immediate humanitarian needs. Uh, particularly uh, focusing on those who are disproportionately affected, including women, children and the vulnerable. Uh, in relation to the request, uh, I would make a few points. Uh, the first um, is you know, Australia uh, will consider further support in consultation with international partners um, following the UN, launch of the UN flash appeal. Um, uh, it is the case that our initial response is on par with many other medium-sized donors. Uh, to be frank, um, uh, there are humanitarian demands uh, around the world, um, including in our near region. Uh, and um, just as we would you know, always like to be able to fund many of the good ideas that were discussed at the Job Summit, so too when it comes to humanitarian aid, I, I always have, and my ministers in the portfolio always have more requests. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Fund. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. The people of Pakistan, Minister, are paying the price for the insatiable appetite of wealthy colonial countries like Australia to keep digging up coal, gas and oil. This obsession is leading to these deadly consequences. Given the death and disaster this is inflicting on the people in Pakistan and the Global South, who did little to contribute to the climate crisis but are the most vulnerable, Will the government now act urgently and commit to no new coal and gas? Yeah. Minister. First, uh, I would. There was much in that question with which I, I, I don't necessarily agree, but I do agree with the proposition uh, that those who are most vulnerable in this world are most vulnerable to climate change, and so. Uh, where you already have poverty, where you already have uh, poor levels of infrastructure, poor levels of economic resilience, uh, then uh, those communities and those nations are far more vulnerable to climate change and far less able to respond. Uh, I would make the point, uh, as I made when I had the privilege of being Australia's climate minister, that pointing the finger uh, at each other when it comes to uh, resolving uh, the uh, global action on climate change uh, was uh, less productive than finding agreement about how we start to reduce emissions. Uh, the senator is right that the vast majority of emissions already uh, in the atmosphere are as a result of developed countries. I would make the point going forward. If you, if you go, if Thank I you, make Minister. The point, your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, we owe it to the people of Pakistan and all others who are on the front line, suffering the worst consequences of the climate crisis, to do everything we can to tackle it. We need fast action on methane to keep a 1.5 degrees centigrade future within reach. Will the government today commit to joining and signing on to the global pledge to cut methane emissions by 30 per cent by 2030? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Uh, I agree. Uh, the government agrees that we, we need urgent action, and it is, it is a pity that this country has spent nearly a decade fighting the climate wars, which have, been, have come at the cost both of jobs and opportunities here in Australia, but also have meant we have not been part of the solution when it comes to global action on climate. Uh, and in that context, I am disappointed to see some. Uh, commentary uh, from the Greens Party that you know the climate wars aren't over, and what I would say to you, what I would say to you is that I think Australians have made it clear they actually want a way forward. They want solutions. 
And whether it's those opposite or, on occasion, those at this end of the chamber, they seem to be more interested in the political benefits of conflict. Oh, sorry, Senator Fruke, you weren't in my line of sight. Yeah, no, that's all right. I just <laughs> want to go to relevance. More than half the time has expired. I had a very specific question about whether the government would commit to joining the global pledge to cut methane emissions. Um, Senator Faruqi, the minister is entitled to take into account the preamble and the question, and I do believe that the minister, you did have a broad preamble. I do believe that the minister is being relevant, minister. Uh, thank you. There was quite a long preamble to which I, I think I am entitled to respond. I think um, we have made public our consideration of the, the methane issue that you have raised. Uh, uh, but I would make the broader point uh, that what we can do is make sure that we get over the climate wars we've seen Thank over, you, over Minister, the last 10 years. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi. Thank you very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. Last week's Jobs and Skills Summit held right here in Parliament House brought together industry groups, business leaders, unions and advocacy groups to address workforce issues right across Australia. Can the minister please detail to the Senate how the outcomes from this summit will benefit the ag industry right now? Minister Watt. I thank Senator Giacconi for another great question about agriculture and industry I know he's very interested in. Uh, firstly, I just want to echo the words of the Prime Minister, who said in relation to the summit that it delivered outcomes that even he could not have hoped for. To see the leaders of groups divided for so long under the previous coalition government Come together to discuss these major workforce and training issues was really something special, and that was certainly the mood of the room. And that applies to agriculture as much as to other industries. The National Farmers Federation and its members were in the same room as unions covering agricultural workers for the first time in many years. And I thank all of those participants for their collaboration and for putting the interests of industry, farmers and workers first rather than political games. And there were some great outcomes from the summit that will benefit the agriculture sector straight away. The government announced an additional $1 billion in joint funding with the states for fee-free TAFE in 2023. And I'll be working with industry, unions and rural Australia to ensure that agriculture gets its fair share. We also announced that the migration cap would be lifted from 165,000 to 195,000, including 34,000 places for the regions, an increase of 9,000 on that that the government, uh, previous government put in place. And again, this increase will help some of the gaps in agricultural workforce. The government also announced money for visa processing to speed that up and clear the backlog of nearly a million people who are waiting because of the previous government's inaction. And again, that will help in the agriculture workforce. And these measures, of course, come on top of the government's existing commitments, including to expand the Palm Scheme and strengthen worker protections. At the end of the summit last week, the NFF president, Fiona Simpson, said that they got sick of waiting for action under the previous government. The ag sector waited for a number of years for the ag visa. They waited for years for investment in training. They waited for years for any movement. And now we're Thank already you, delivering Your after 107 has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you, President. That's wonderful news. Thank you, Minister. Can the minister outline what measures from the summit will be implemented to alleviate these workforce issues in the agriculture industry over the next 12 months? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you again, Senator Giacconi. In the lead-up to the summit, a historic meeting was held between agriculture and processing employers, unions and government. This was something the former government couldn't do and wouldn't do. Actually getting people in the same room to talk about shared challenges, something the previous government just not, would not bother even trying to do. And as a direct result, result of that meeting, we have established a tripartite agriculture workforce working group uh, to progress an agreed list of items needing further consideration. During the Jobs and Skills Summit, the NFF, Australian Pork Limited, Wool Producers Australia, JBS and the Australian Meat Industry Council joined the ACTU, the AWU, UWU and the Meat Workers Union at a signing ceremony to try and find agreement on these issues moving forward. This group will pursue uh, solutions to a better skill, attract, protect and retain workers across the ag sector. Having these different sectors, who were once so divided, come together was a fantastic step thank forward you, in Minister, dealing with these issues. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Coney, second supplementary. Oh, thank you very much, President. And what great spirit of cooperation there was during the Jobs Summit last week. And I want to thank the Minister. Can the Minister also advise the Senate 
how this new spirit of cooperation compares to the previous approach undertaken by the coalition government. Oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Ciccone, for observing the spirit of cooperation. It sounds like some others could, could learn from that. One of the things that was mentioned during the press conference that we held, Order. a press conference that we held with the NFF, its members, and every union that covers the agriculture workforce, one of the things that was mentioned was how unlikely this tripartite working group would have been under the previous government. And it's no surprise when you have the leader of the National Party, who says he represents farmers, consistently hurling insults at the nation's peak farming body. Previously, he claimed that they don't represent farmers, they're only the peak body for farmers. He's called them ignorant, and just last week he called them cowards. No wonder the former government, with an attitude like that, couldn't deliver a single worker under their agriculture visa scheme. They couldn't get consensus within their own coalition, let alone within the wider sector. It's just more of the same from the Liberals and Nationals dividing Australians instead of bringing them together. Uh, but I will give Mr Littleproud credit for turning up, because who wasn't there? The one person who wasn't there was the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Thank Dutton. Thank you, Minister Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Minister, Senator Gallagher for the Minister for Health. A peer-reviewed paper last week in the establishment scientific journal Vaccine examined Pfizer's COVID vaccine randomised phase three clinical trials data. It used the World Health Organisation's framework made for this purpose, the Brighton Collaboration on Adverse Events of Special Interest. Authors include virology and pharmacology experts from UCLA, Stanford, University of Baltimore and Queensland's Bond University. The paper concluded that Pfizer's vaccine was associated with a 36 per cent increase in serious adverse events. The most common were coagulation disorders and acute cardiac injury. In every 10,000 people injected, 18 will experience a life-threatening or altering medical complication. Serious adverse events from Pfizer's COVID vaccine are four times higher than any benefit in reduced hospitalisation. Minister, is Pfizer's vaccine safe? And do you advise Australians to continue taking it? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I must say I haven't uh, read the paper that <laughs> Senator Roberts is citing from. Um, but in answer to his question, are the um, vaccines safe? Yes, they are. Uh, they have prevented the successful deployment of vaccinations across the world. Have prevented probably millions of deaths from COVID-19, particularly in those vulnerable populations, older people, people who have a disability or are immunocompromised. Uh, and we've done very well here in Australia. We've got some more to do in terms of fourth doses, where it's only still, I think, about 40 per cent of eligible people have received uh, their fourth dose. Uh, but the vaccine is safe. It's been an incredibly effective health measure to manage the pandemic, to deal, to protect lives, and to um, to protect economic loss that would have otherwise occurred from uh, such a, a serious global pandemic. Um, and I think we, you know, we put, have put our trust in the health experts in Australia from the beginning of this pandemic. Their advice hasn't changed. ATAGI, who have considered all of the matters, the scientific panel that have looked at them, uh, the TGA, who has approved the vaccines. They have been through rigorous processes to ensure that they are safe. And where there have been adverse events, and there have been, unfortunately, including um, serious adverse events um, from the loss of life, uh, the advice has changed. Uh, and the vaccine program was changed to deal with that. And where there have been adverse events, they have all been reported publicly uh, on the TGA website so that people are able to see the data and see the changing health advice around the vaccines. But yes, they are safe and people should have their vaccine, including their fourth Thank dose. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. 63 million COVID injections means up to 113,000 Australians suffered serious adverse events. Since the vaccine's release, all-cause mortality after allowing for COVID deaths is at record highs. This paper proves COVID vaccines cause serious side effects, in 13 cases fatal. The TGA admits children are being given myocarditis and pericarditis. Minister, where's the Royal Commission that your own COVID committee called for? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. Well, we didn't call for a royal commission into the um, in vaccine safety, um, so let's be clear on that. 
um, as chair, uh, there was a recommendation about uh, looking at all aspects of the pandemic response, but it is different, and I don't want to be involved in any conspiracy about vaccines. Thanks very much. They are safe. The evidence has been provided. The data is available on the website, and I would say to Senator Roberts, uh, because I, I, I do have time for you, Senator Roberts, we have good discussions and have had through the pandemic, is if you are concerned by this paper you have read, I would urge you to refer it to the TGA or to the, to the AHPPC or to ATAGI and get their considered opinion on it to see whether there are, you know, to see and, and perhaps listen to the other side. Um, of those experts who have been working on vaccine and vaccine safety. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. The vaccines are causing coagulation disorders, and this will show in a reduction in live births. The Australian Bureau of Statistics receives live birth data six weeks post death, so we should be seeing live so, sorry, six weeks post birth. So we should be seeing live birth data to June 2022. Yet the ABS data stops at December 2020. Minister, why is this government holding back two and a half years of live birth data? What are you covering up? Minister. Of, um, well, we're not covering up anything uh, for a start, so just to answer your question directly. Secondly, on, you know, on issues of um, of births, live births, maternal deaths or deaths of babies, usually those, that data is uh, reported and it's reported at state and territory uh, level. So I'm sure that that data uh, does exist if you are interested in it. Where there have been um, ad, uh, side effects from the vaccine, and there have been some, um, I'm sure many in this chamber got them, headaches, feeling a bit tired and, and escalating into more serious conditions, they have been appropriately managed and advised on by uh, all of those experts. So when there was some concerns about blood clotting and myocarditis in young men, I think in teenage boys particularly, those issues uh, were addressed and were managed, including by providing advice to anyone who is a vaccination provider uh, to keep an eye out for any conditions like that. And you'll see from the data that the TGA. Um, Thank you, Minister. Sorry, Your time I could has go expired. on. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Northern Australia, Senator Watt. During the inquiry into the government's climate change bills, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility indicated there are a total of eight coal and gas-related opportunities within the project pipeline. Can the Minister guarantee the continuation of these projects? Thank you, Senator. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, as the former Shadow Minister for Northern Australia, I don't require a folder for this answer, uh, but, I, but I thank you for the question, uh, Senator Macdonald. Um, I think it's well understood that the Labor Party's position in relation to any resource project, coal, uh, coal gas or any other mineral, uh, is that we assess it on its merits. Uh, our, our, we don't, do not uh, have the same position of the Greens, which is a blanket ban. We do not have the position of the opposition, uh, which is to support every single project without having a look at the environmental or economic benefits of it. We have a sensible approach. We have a sensible approach. So we, we, our position is very simple. If a, if a particular project stacks up economically, environmentally and socially, then it will go ahead. Uh, every project will go through uh, the proper assessment proposals. Every, every project has to stack up economically. Every project has to pass the environmental tests and get the environmental ap approvals. So uh, the projects that you're talking about are hypothetical in nature at this point in time, uh, but uh, should those projects be applied for, then we'll consider them on their merits. Thank you, a Minister. Second, a first supplementary, Senator Macdonald. Can the Minister outline how the proposed bill will affect the future investment decisions by NAIF, considering the government's commitment to increasing gas supply. Thank you, Senator. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Macdonald. Again, the position being put forward by this bill, this historic bill uh, from this government, is that what we will do for the first time is lock in an interim emissions target of 43 per cent by 2030. It's a real target. 
It doesn't rely on technology that has yet to be invented, uh, and that is, of course, a pathway to net zero by 2050. And uh, I might say to Senator Macdonald and other members of the opposition that these targets are targets that are already committed to by pretty much every resources company in the country. Uh, every resources in the country that you care to think about has committed to net zero by 2050. Um, they are all already making changes uh, to reduce their emissions, and frankly, what this government is doing is actually just trying to catch up with where industry is on the way to then leading. It's something that, unfortunately, the former government didn't do. We saw industry get well ahead of the former government's policy, and all that did was deprive regional Australians of jobs. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Thank you. That didn't answer my last question at all. Can the minister guarantee that no proposed or committed gas projects currently within NAVE's pipeline will be refused financing as a result of changes under the legislation? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I've seen no evidence whatsoever that this government intends to change NAVE's investment mandate or rules uh, in the way Senator Macdonald is talking about. Um, sorry? Uh, no. Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie, that is disorderly. Minister, Thank you, President. The As the minister representing the Northern Australia minister, I have seen no evidence to speak of. What, thank you, Senator Green, for reminding me. The only government that we have seen uh, interfere with the NAIF's investment decisions about investing in resources and energy projects is the former government, which killed off a wind farm outside uh, Cairns, the Caban project that would have delivered about 250 jobs to Cairns. Oh, sorry, Senator Macdonald. A point of order. I specifically asked about uh, oh, the just a changes moment, Senator under Senator Macdonald. Senator Green, I would ask you if that was you uh, to desist. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. <laughs> I specifically asked about uh, the, pipe, uh, the projects within the NAIF pipeline to be refused funding as a result of changes under this legislation. Thank you, Senator. Yes, thank you, Senator Macdonald, and I do believe the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Again, what the climate uh, change bill is about is about bringing in an interim target to reduce our emissions. Uh, there is nothing in the bill that I'm aware of that would have the effect that Senator Macdonald is talking about, uh, and I would certainly hope that uh, she and her colleagues are not intending to continue the same scare tactics that we saw for 10 years that held back investment, drove up our emissions and cost jobs. Uh, thank you, Minister. Yeah. Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Minister, the Treasurer was quoted this morning in relation to the indexation of income support payments as saying, we know that it won't solve every problem for everybody, but it's important that we try and make sure that those payments keep up and that we acknowledge that times will still be tough for a lot of people. Minister, today's indexation of income support payments is less than $2 a day extra for someone on JobSeeker. This pathetic increase will leave millions of Australians in really tough times, with payments that are not keeping up, that aren't within cooey of the poverty line, let alone giving people enough to live on. Minister, poverty is a political choice. Why won't your government choose to increase the rate of job seeker above the poverty line? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. I thank you, President, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. It's, an, it's an, on an important topic and one which um, the government has been uh, looking at closely in terms of um, you know, when we've been working through our line-by-line -line audit of uh, those opposites budget and how they used to allocate money to see how we can make sure that every dollar that is going um, is being spent is actually quality spending going to supporting um, Australia and the Australian people. We've been clear though about the rate of job seeker. This did come up quite a number of times during the election campaign, and our commitment was uh, to look at payments um, through the budget process uh, and to um, you know to look at, at basically how how much money is available and and ease cost of living where we can. But we didn't make a commitment to in, increase uh, job seeker over and above the indexation arrangements, which because of the high inflation, um, it will be a very, very significant adjustment to the parameters in the October budget, which 
the budget will have to accommodate as well. I mean, part of the issue we're dealing with here is a trillion dollars of Liberal debt, uh, deficits for as far as the eye can see. We do need to be fiscally responsible as well. Uh, and that is, they are the challenges facing us as we put together our first budget. Um, we cannot just go and increase um, or fund all of the good ideas that we would like to fund because we've inherited an absolute mess from those opposite. Um, significant budgets, trillion dollars in debt, programs growing, terminating Senator measures McGrath. that were, are not, have no funding beyond the, first, the next two years. These are the challenges that we're trying to grapple with. But rest assured, we will do a better job and we will care about people uh, much more than those Thank you, people Minister, opposite Minister, the time did. has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, Minister. Minister, you talk about spending every dollar in a quality way of the trillion dollars of Liberal debt of being fiscally responsible. And I repeat, poverty is a political choice. Can you explain then why you are choosing to implement the stage three tax cuts, which will give $244 billion over the next 10 years to billionaires and the ultra-wealthy and to everybody in this place, while people on JobSeeker are forced to live below the poverty Thank line? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. So the priority for the government is actually doing what we can now in the immediate term to deal with um, the budget mess we've got and deal with the cost of living pressures Australians are facing. The, the, we have not changed our view on stage three tax cuts. They don't come in until July 2024. There is an immediate issue here right now that we are working through. And believe me, we are working hard every day to go through the budget to try and make room for good ideas that we would like to fund over and above uh, the commitments we made in the election campaign. But in terms of putting, uh, putting cost, immediate cost of living relief, they will be things that we do within the October budget, like making medicines cheaper, like it, making the investments in cheaper childcare, and the quite significant um, parameter variations that we'll have uh, on indexing payments, which will make a difference for people who are living on those payments. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, I'll, I'll ask it another way. Can you explain why people below, living below the poverty line are going to receive a measly $1.84 a day, while Labor's stage three tax cuts will give Clive Palmer and everybody earning over $200,000 an extra $24.86 a day? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Well, my answer is the same as the previous question, which is that we are focused right now on the next two years and what we can do to deal with some of these cost of living pressures immediately. Those increase, the indexation increases to payments will flow um, through the adjustment made at the end of September. So they will provide some assistance to people uh, as we put in place other arrangements to deal with cost of living, such as our childcare policy and such as our cheaper medicines that we will also do. In terms of um, stage three, we haven't changed our view on that, but that is not until 2024. These issues that people are dealing with right now are right now, and that's our focus as we put together the October budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. What is the Minister doing to help Australian pensioners deal with the lack of action and neglect of cost of living issues that is the legacy of the Morrison government? Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Walsh for her question. And Congratulate her on the terrific job she's uh, continuing to do for the people of uh, Victoria. <coughs> um, the Albanese uh, Labor government has overseen the largest indexation increases to government payment in the history of more than 30 years of Australian government allowances. For Australian pensioners, they haven't seen a rise like this in over 12 years over the entire length of the former cold-hearted Liberal National Coalition government that now sits opposite uh, because the Australian people simply had enough. <clears throat> enough of the lack of economic planning to lead us out of the pandemic. Enough of the uh, lazy policy that has left our nation's most disadvantaged 
the most exposed to the tumultuous global economic uh, conditions. This government is committed to serving all Australians and ensuring that no matter what your circumstances, there is a strong social safety net to protect you when you need it most. This reflects the fundamental principles of this government to leave no one behind and uh, hold no one back. This indexation will be yet uh, another building block that we are putting in place to help ordinary Australians manage and challenging economic times that we face, ensuring that the government payments keep up with the cost of living. Madam President, uh, our government understands the challenges Australian households are facing with increasing cost of living pressures, especially those on low incomes. The measure to uh, increase uh, government payments by 4 per cent demonstrates yet again how we are committed to a welfare system that supports the most vul vulnerable Australians, encourages those who are able to work or study and remains you, sustainable for future generations. Thank you, Minister. That time for has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, is the indexation measure the only boost that aged pensioners can expect from this government? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President, and, and again I thank the Senator for her uh, very important question. Yeah. Indexation is not the only measure our government has announced in order to assist pensioners. As discussed in the chamber this morning, following the uh, Albanese's, uh, job and, uh, Albanese government's Jobs and Skills Summit, we announced uh, an increase in the amount pensioners will be able to earn before losing any of their pension. From the 1st of December 2022, Pensioners uh, uh, on uh, the old age uh, pension will have their work bonuses income bank uh, credited with $4,000. This will take the maximum work bonus income bank from $7,800 to $11,800 until the 30th of June 2023. The $4,000 increase will be added to each age pensioner's work bonus income. Uh, bank uh, up, uh, up front. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, what else is the government doing to address the cost of living pressures, pressures facing Australians? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Th again, thank the Senator for her uh, question um, and her commitment to uh, the most disadvantaged people in our community. <coughs> the indexation measures announced will go some way to easing the cost of living burden facing Australia. And some of our society's most disadvantaged people are feeling that most keen keenly. These indexation me measures have been implemented to address the CPI rate to increase of 4 per cent. The indexation will continue to be applied on a six monthly basis. The factors causing price increases are multifaceted and uh, we must uh, work to address them across budget cycles. We are spending around $126 billion on income support payments through the uh, Social Security and Social Services portfolio, which encompasses uh, family assistance and student assistance payments in 2022 uh, and 2023. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin. President, uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Is the Minister aware of reports today that the Space Industry Association of Australia is asserting that there has been no substantial engagement with the space industry by any ministerial office in Canberra, that the space policy is in a vacuum, that the critical national space infrastructure projects totalling $2.5 billion are stalled on departmental desks? And it appears to many that space has fallen through the cracks in Canberra. And can the minister reconcile his government's reported neglect of Australia's strategic Order. and economic importance, space industry, with the government's stated commitment to the industry thank sector? Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and uh, I thank uh, uh, the senator for his uh, his question. Um, um, we're certainly not uh, <coughs> letting space uh, fall between the uh, cracks, uh, and you're, you, you ought to know better than that coming from South Australia, uh, Senator. That's right. you, know, you know all about <coughs> what the Malinowskis government is doing in South Australia 
uh, and what the Albanese government is doing uh, nationally on this issue. We're, we're revitalising uh, the space industry, which for 10 years under your uh, former government uh, was left to, uh, to wallow. Um, now, I, uh, I, I, you, you ought to know, you ought to know, Senator, exactly what's going on. For instance, in Port Lincoln, Port Lincoln in South Australia is going to be the basis for um, <coughs> further space ex exploration, further, further launches of rockets uh, into space. Now, <coughs> I, was, I, I, was recently, I was recently in the United States and I met with a company that's looking at Port Lincoln <coughs> to build a new space station. And the idea, the idea of this space station, you'll like this. It's a centrifuge. It's a centrifuge, and 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 this spins round and round and round and fires a rocket up into space. And instead of instead of costing, instead of costing, instead of costing, Minister Farrell, instead of, please resume your seat. Order. I'm waiting for the Senate to settle down before I call the minister. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. And it fires a rocket up into space. And instead Senator of costing McGrath. about $2 million uh, per rocket launch, uh, that costs about $250,000. So it's going to significantly reduce Thank you, the Minister. Your time has expired. Senator McLaughlin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. And I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive answer. <laughs> and can I, can I ask him, arising from that answer, explain the Space Industry Association of Australia's revelation that no space industry representative was invited to the government's job and skills summit last week, despite the sector employing more than 10,000 workers and contributing billions to the national economy? Uh, thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Order. Order. Minister. Well, I can't quite work out the uh, <coughs> senator's line of questioning here. Either, we're, either this government is doing something about um, the space industry and therefore creating all those jobs, uh, or, it's, or it's not. But you can't have it both ways, uh, with due respect, uh, Senator. The reality is, the reality is, the reality is, <coughs> I, as a young man, I can remember rockets being fired at Woomera uh, in South Australia. You, you let that entire industry go. You let that entire um, industry. Minister, thank you. Uh, Senator Birmingham. I, I hate to do it, Madam President, but a, a point of order on direct relevance. As, as much as the trips down Senator Farrell's memory lane are most entertaining for the chamber, there was a question from Senator McLaughlin, which did go particularly to why the government did not invite representatives of the space industry to the Jobs and Skills Summit. And I find it hard to understand how Senator Farrell's recollections of what was happening at Woomera when he was a young man have any bearing whatsoever you, on the invite list for the Jobs and Skills Summit. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, when there's quiet in the chamber, I will address your point of order. I will ask. I will redirect uh, Senator Farrell to the question, which was specifically about the Jobs and Skills Summit. Thank you, Minister. Uh, with, with due respect, uh, President, I thought I'd answered that uh, directly in, uh, in my first sentence. That, that, that didn't make any sense for what Senator, uh, the Senator was uh, was asking. Um, look, the uh, the fact of the matter is that. Um, the Jobs and Skills uh, Summit that uh, we held last week and that uh, Senator Gallagher uh, had a very significant contribution uh, involved, involved a whole range— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator McLaughlin, second supplementary. Western Australian. Order. Uh, Minister. As you be aware, the government is yet to respond to the inquiry of the other place into the developing Australia's space industry, and which reported in December, and can he please advise the chamber when we will receive a response to that report? Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Farrell, Minister. Well, let me let me tell you, and I'll reiterate what I started my uh, comments uh, with these questions about. 
the Melanousis government, the Melanousis government in South Australia, very fine man, very fine man, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Melanouskas, and the Albanese government at the federal level will ensure that the space industry flourishes in this country. We're all about, we're all about um, bringing industry back to Australia. You let it go. <coughs> Do you remember about Holdens? What you did to Holdens in South Australia? What you did to Mitsubishi? Oh, that was a long time ago. But <coughs> uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Order. Senator McGrath. I'm sorry. Uh, when, when those on my left are quiet, I will ask Senator Birmingham for his point of order. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Pre Pre President, again, a point of order on direct relevance. We, we seem to be on the rather earthly matters of cars at present from Senator Farrell, rather than, of course, the actual question that relates to the space industry and the jobs from the space industry. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do note Senator Farrell was just getting started, but um, I'm, sure, I'm sure he will get to the directness of that question. Uh, Minister. Uh, we're waiting. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, we intend to rebuild manufacturing in this country. You kicked, you kicked all of these comp companies uh, out of our country. We're bringing them back, and space, space is going to be an absolutely vital part of that. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Can I ask honourable senators to make their way out of the chamber in, in an orderly fashion, please? Are there, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Hughes. Deputy President, I rise to take note of Senator Hume's questions to Minister Gallagher. Now, I know those opposite are still adjusting to what we know as government. They've spent so long in opposition, and we know they've spent the majority of time in opposition since Federation. But what they do need to start to understand is that they actually are in government now, and that government is actually about governing. It's about taking tough decisions in tough circumstances. Now, unlike those us, opposite, we actually will demonstrate some grace and will acknowledge that there are plenty of global influences that are creating cost of living pressures that many, many Australians are experiencing. But what that means, though, is that it is even more important that the government, which is, again, those opposite, be proactive in their response. We need to make sure that the government is making decisions that are going to have the best possible outcome for Australian families as they face the challenges that cost of living pressures are creating. Now, what our role over here is to hold them to account. Now, we, like to, we need to have a look at what's being proposed and, outrageously, we will actually make suggestions. We will propose things, having had a great depth of experience in government, of some of these solutions that would make an immediate difference. And one of those, what we talked about today, allowing pensioners, both on the disability support pension and the age pension, to increase the number of hours that they're able to work without having an impact on their pension. Now, we suggested this back in June 2022, so over 100 days ago. Uh, the idea apparently has now filtered through, not as an effective uh, way as we have proposed. But now, through their job skills slash talk fest with the unions, they have come to some thought process that it might actually be worth considering. But this is where those in government now need to understand, and the Labor Party needs to understand that they actually need to put national interests first 
not their interests first. Not just the unions' interests first. They need to put all Australians' interests first, and that includes small businesses, that includes families, that includes people that don't pay union fees. Because the people that pay union fees are about 10 per cent of the workforce, not the 41 per cent of the workforce, who are actually employed by small businesses, who are represented by one person versus the 33 representing unions at the Skills Talk Fest held last week. Now, we know that we're not going to see any action taken by this government unless it gets signed off by the unions, that the tummy gets scratched by John Setker, and there they go and say, OK, the unions say we can do it. And I did note uh, with uh, much, much interest uh, as Senator O'Farrell's comparison between the South Australian government and the Albanese government, well, the South Australian government gave the donation of the CFMMEU uh, back after the ABCC claims became public, unlike the Albanese government. But we saw in question time again today the ministers that are responsible—we know there's only four of you because the Albanese government didn't put much weight on this chamber, so only appointed four ministers. Estimates are going to be crackingly long days and weeks for you. Uh, looking forward to them, looking forward to them. And Senator Polly, I hope we're there together. You know I like to give it a bit of interest for you. But they're just obfuscating when it comes to questions. They like to look back. The rearview mirror its where they're focused because they don't have a solution. They don't have a plan. As they told us through the election campaign, they had a plan for a plan. We're just waiting to see what the plan is. They don't have a plan to address inflation, but hilariously today here they are claiming about the indexation of the pension. Well, the policy for a very long time is the pension's been indexed every six months in line with inflation. That's why it's going up so much is because inflation is so high. In fact, the last time we had inflation this high was back in the days, and for those of us, I, unfortunately, I, I don't go back to Woomera, I don't go back as far as Senator O'Farrell, but I do go back when I was at school to the recession we had to have. That was the last time inflation was as high as it is today. The recession we had to have under Prime Minister Keating, well, I'm just looking forward to those lines coming again, because the Albanese government looks like it's insistent on emulating the failures of the Keating government. This talk, this skills fest wasn't in the way of Hawke. It was a Rudd 2020 special that's going to produce a whole lot of nothing yet again. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Well, what a lot of codswallop that we have here from the opposition this afternoon. We have here, in taking note uh, of the minister's answer to the question of uh, what this government is doing in relation to inflation uh, on small business, we have seen from the government's own contribution to this debate an absolute reflection of the fact that they were missing in action on all of these issues while in government themselves. But as Senator Gallagher clearly outlined in the government's response, we are moving on past that wasted decade to absolutely get on with addressing this cost of living crisis. We had a wasted decade in relation to not having an energy policy for 10 years. That is 22 failed policies under the former government. That is what small business has told us. It has had real inflationary consequences because of their lack of capacity to invest with certainty in strategic direction. We are also dealing with the cost of living crisis by making submissions to the Fair Work Commission to ensure that those on the minimum wage actually get a decent pay rise. And as has been highlighted, this is something that is supported uh, by business broadly. We've seen support from COSBOA even for industrial instruments that make things simpler for them, because that too will create a more stable and less complicated business environment. It will enable them to compete to keep uh, employees 
uh, without needing to go into their own new rounds of bargaining. We've extended some of the pandemic payments that those opposite had ended, and we have kept them going. And this week, we will be debating, finally, our climate change bill to put in place uh, a scheme for our nation to give us some certainty around our energy and climate change future. All of these elements of uncertainty and chaos uh, propagated by the former government are absolutely seeded in the current inflation crisis. We are working to put downward pressure on our nation's uh, costs for businesses and households. We're doing this through cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, and we re uh, just announced this week in the lead up to the October budget, very important announcements to support households keep up with their medication costs. So that we're going from $40 a prescription down to, I think it is about 32. We also have plans to deal with the skills crisis through fee-free TAFE places, because we've had for years uh, a government that has absolutely failed to deal with critical workforce shortages, to deal with investment in skills and training, investment that is much needed to make sure young people, older workers and our businesses have the skills that they need for now and into the future. These are just a small handful of the things that we have done in just three months. Just three months. Whereas those opposite ceded uh, the problems that our, our government now faces, and that is beleaguering households and small businesses right around the country. As the Prime Minister said, this government is pro-business, pro-working with business, pro-working with business to deal with the challenges that they are facing right now. We are dealing with a decade of wasted opportunity and inaction from those opposite. And they now come in here and start blaming us all Senator, for the years and Senator years Pratt, of inaction. Expired. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. Mr Deputy President, and I too rise uh, to take note of the response to Senator Hume's question by Senator Gallagher. Well, the old expression that we all know is leopards don't change their spots. And there is nothing more certain that Labor in government never, ever change their spots. They uh, talk down the economy. They're always hoping for things to go wrong and so disappointed when they don't. They make plans for having plans. And we've just heard again from the speakers opposite of all of their plans to have a plan to govern. They've got summits, they've got conferences, they've got reviews, they've got royal commissions. They have got everything they can do to prevent them from making a decision. Newsflash to those opposite. Government is difficult. Government is challenging. But in government, you have to make decisions. I'm absolutely at a loss to know what the opposition have done, what the now government did in opposition. You had many years to actually get um, across the economy, to get across COVID policy, to get across jobs policy. But it seems all you've done is talk to the trade unions in opposition and now finding many ways, instead of actually coming out and being honest, that the trade union movement is behind pretty much everything that you're now putting forward, your plans for a plan. Be honest and actually just come out and say, this is what the trade union movement wants. In fact, why don't you put Sally McManus on the front bench? That would be more honest than the approach that you are now taking to deal with the cost of living uh, problems, industrial relations and many other things. Now, uh, when I say that leopards don't change their spots, I just want to read out something. And perhaps colleagues, you might like to guess who said it and when in relation to the Labor Party. 
Our opponents, the Labor Party, have been destructive critics. They have politically welcomed every difficulty. They have prophesied and hoped for disasters, depression, mass unemployment, financial collapse. These have been their gloomy political stock in trade. All their prophecies have failed. And instead of depression, we have a record, we have a record prosperity under the Liberal government of the day. Instead of unemployment, we have a record level of employment at high wages. Instead of financial collapse, we have the highest national income on record, the largest exports and international reserves, splendid credits, buoyant loan markets and stabilised prices. Today, bitterly frustrated by the failure of Labor's past prophecies, they are struggling to raise false issues and new prejudices and to make glittering promises to distract attention from real and solid achievements. Colleagues, this was Sir Robert Menzies in 1954 talking about the Labor Party. And had I not just told you that, you would have thought it is actually been right here today in this chamber from those who now occupy the government benches. So, as I said, newsflash, government is hard. You have to make thousands and thousands of ministerial decisions every day based on the best evidence before you. You don't have a plan for a plan. You don't hold summits and wait three months for things that you could have done on day one and coming into government. Instead, you have reviewed, talked, held faux summits so you can get trade union ideas through under the guise of uh, you know, consulting uh, with very few West Australians, may I say. Oh, but let me tell you what government, good government actually looks like. Despite all of the rhetoric from those opposites now uh, you know, doing triple somersaults to try and reinvent the past, the coalition government responded quickly with the targeted cost of living package, which eased pressure on household budgets when they needed it most under our government. We provided lower taxes to around 10 million Australians received, received tax relief of uh, $1,500 when they now, today, lodging their tax returns. This includes the $420 cost of living tax offset for low and middle income earners. We delivered a $250 cost of living payment to nearly 6 million pensioners, welfare recipients, veterans and eligible concession card holders. We cut the fuel excise in half for six months, saving a family with two cars who filled up once a week at least $30 a week. We reduced the price of medicines and health costs for thousands and thousands of medicines. That is what good government looks like. So for those uh, opposites, at some point you are going to have to start making decisions, being honest about what you're doing and govern in this nation's best interest. Senator Polly. Yes, thank you. Well, I thought when we came back this week that uh, those opposite might have actually taken heed of what happened here uh, in this parliament last Thursday and Friday with the National uh, Jobs and Skills Summit. Now, it obviously hurts them greatly to see business, unions, NGOs and people of, uh, of community leaders coming together in the same room talking about the issues that matter to the Australian people. Now, of course, those opposite they don't want to see things change because what they like is to see chaos and division within the community. They don't like to see the business community and small businesses talking and working with the union movement because you know that's not part of their script. Well, the issues have been known. We went to the election saying that we would have a job summit. Because it's not just this federal government's responsibility to come up with all the ideas and the solutions going forward. It needs to be one of a collected uh, acknowledgement of what the issues are and whether or not we've got the answers moving forward. But just um, one of the things that the previous government, those in opposition, part of their economic uh, plan was to stagnate wages. So they have said time and time again that was part of their plan. Well, the reality is stagnant wages does have an impact on small businesses, which is what this question that was asked went to small businesses and the cost of living. 
Yes, there is higher um, inflation, and gee, golly gosh, we've been in uh, government now for about 112 days, but you know we were supposed to forget uh, the last nine years of the Turnbull, um, Abbott, and Morrison governments. There are uh, real issues with uh, standards of living in this country, but we have to we have to address that in a collective sense. We need to ensure that there are good, secure jobs. So. To do that, we've already invested in relation to and outlined our plan for, aid, uh, for uh, childcare. We want more women back in the workforce. We want to make sure that there is uh, proper negotiation and uh, flexibility between the business community and unions in negotiating the ways forward. These are all sensible ideas, but what do we see from those opposite? Back to the old scare campaign, heavens above, if you have business and unions uh, working together, oh no, what we're going to have is strikes. Strikes. What a lot of nonsense. It's time to move into the 21st century. What we want to see is more sustainable investment. We want to create a sustainable economy that sees good, well paid jobs. We want people to have the skills that's going to be needed for the future. Part of that is going to be we have to um, uh, change and open up migration so that we can bring the skills in, because even with the investment we're making in TAFE, what we're not going to be able to do is fill the jobs that are now there and need to be filled. We've got a, a new uh, problem, and it is a good problem to have. We've got more jobs than we have workers, so we're not going to be able to address that without bringing new skilled migrants into this country that will not only fill those positions but will add riches, richness to our um, culture and to our economy. But all we see from those opposite is criticism. It's like they can't just say, gee, this government is getting on with it. I mean, what we didn't see was we didn't see Mr uh, Dutton um, at the summit, but what we did see was Mr um, Littleproud, who was there, and I'd have to say making a contribution. You know, maybe he should resign from his party and join the Liberal Party so that they've got a, a leader. But I have to say, Mr. 22 per cent, which is Mr. Dutton, who's better known as of uh, this morning's newspaper, uh, he has a lot to learn because people in the electorates are sick and tired of the division. They want governments and oppositions and other parties to work together so that they come up with a stronger economy, more secure jobs. We have more women back in the workforce. We pay people in aged care a proper wage. Those who are looking after our youngest minds in early childhood education, we need more people investing in those jobs and we need to make sure that they are remunerated accordingly. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Bragg. Deputy President, I must say that in rising to give note about the answers today that, uh, in my experience, it hasn't been a successful strategy for politicians to quote opinion polls, uh, but uh, we wish you well with that, agenda, that approach. Um, the, uh, I mean, look, the, the point is that the, uh, the government so far, which won the election uh, with very few policies, uh, has gone in search of some policies. Uh, and it has tried to do that by talking to a series of vested interests. And when I call this government a government for vested interests, uh, it is a serious point that I'm trying to make. One of the consequences of being a government for vested interests is that there are good ideas, could, could be some good ones, maybe some bad ones. There are good ideas that are not considered because the funnel is so small. And there have been, I think, some missed opportunities over the last seven days or so. I was surprised that there wasn't more consideration given to a small business award, a simple set of conditions that could cut across the complexity that many small businesses face in our economy. Um, I was surprised to hear the Labor Party talk about their desire to see higher wages but not consider the fact that compulsory superannuation increases 80 per cent 
of the projected wages growth in the budget. Uh, I was surprised that people didn't consider, well, maybe we could use uh, that superannuation system uh, to deliver wages growth now. Uh, I was surprised uh, that the super funds, of course, one of the strongest vested interests in this government, came to Canberra asking for another tax cut, asking for a scheme which would allow them to own all the houses, to become the landlords in Australia, where Australians would become serfs to the super funds uh, and be forced into renting for life. So those are the things that we could have had a discussion about, uh, but instead what we have seen is a series of policy initiatives designed to fill the coffers of the closest friends of the government. Now, of course, we've already seen, just in the last seven days, uh, the Attorney-General uh, announcing that he would abolish the regulation we put in place for class action lawyers, where people who are seeking redress through the court system uh, often find that the awards that they are provided by the courts are eaten up by blood-sucking class action lawyers. Uh, we also find uh, that the Assistant Treasurer, Mr Stephen Jones, on Friday afternoon makes a regulation to conceal $30 million in payments from super funds to unions uh, that are due by 2030. $30 million per annum. Uh, this is on top of the $130 or $40 million over the past 10 years. It's already been paid from the super funds into the union. So Jones, Mr Jones or Minister Jones uh, has delivered that. Uh, and then of course you see uh, Mr Jones's other uh, initiative, which is to review the best financial interest duty that the super funds face, uh, thanks to coalition reform. Now, why would you want to review a best financial interest duty? Well, only because you want to permit payments which are banned today. And then, of course, uh, the other matter, which is before the Senate later tonight, the matter of the abolition of the Building and Construction Commission, uh, which, of course, uh, has been a successful institution which has upheld the rule of law uh, on construction sites, which of course is a very large industry, almost 10 per cent of GDP. So again, you see payoff for the CFMEU. Um, so between the class action lawyers and the super funds and the unions, uh, you have seen the government try to, to deliver their agenda in their first 100 days. Now, we're only 100 days into this government and eventually uh, the vested interests will run out of ideas that are in the top drawer. Uh, the big risk for the country is what's in the second drawer. Uh, it could be um, even crazier ideas. Now, again, my good friend, uh, Member for Whitlam, has already talked about 15 per cent super. Now, that would be a really good way to crash wages, uh, but I'm sure that there are many, many other ideas uh, that will come from the vested interests and be facilitated by this government in the near future. Thank you. I'll, I have to put the question first, Senator Furuki, and then I'll give you the call. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Hughes. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Furuki. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the government's response to my question regarding the floods in Pakistan. The scale of the floods in Pakistan is difficult to grasp. As Fahad Said, a climate impact scientist in Islamabad, recently said, words like colossal, mammoth and gigantic don't do justice to the situation. 33 million people are affected. That's more than the population of Australia. Perhaps that gives you some idea of the enormity of this disaster. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Those who have seen the pictures coming out of Pakistan have seen the deadly face of this climate catastrophe. I speak to my Ammi and relatives back in Pakistan every night who are beside themselves at the death and destruction with one third of the country underwater and so many lives, livelihoods, homes and infrastructure lost. My heart, my thoughts and my duas are with those who are suffering. I've been meeting with the Pakistani Australian community here who have come together so quickly to raise funds to support the relief and reconstruction efforts. The Pakistani community is known for its generosity and where, wherever they are, they are opening up their hearts and their wallets. 
I cannot say the same for the Australian government. The $2 million of aid they have committed to is in fact insulting. It is nowhere near our fair share. Australia needs to do more. The floods in Pakistan were caused by monsoon rains 10 times more severe than normal. Global warming is melting glaciers, which are worsening the floods. This is a climate fueled disaster. The harsh reality is that disasters like this will happen again and again unless there is strong and urgent action to tackle the climate crisis. Pakistan is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, but has contributed little to the climate emergency. The people of Pakistan are paying with their lives and livelihoods for a crisis knowingly created and exacerbated by the global north. And despite multiple warnings from experts, the scientific consensus about the causes of the climate crisis, rich countries like Australia refuse to do what's necessary and stop digging up coal and gas. At the core of the crisis is the Global North's rampant extractive capitalism and pursuit of incessant economic growth, whatever the cost. The cost of this greed is being paid by countries and their people like Pakistan. The extreme greed is mirrored by an extreme stinginess when it comes to the consequences of that crisis. Rich countries promised finance to help poorer countries deal with, the climate, deal with climate change as a recognition of their responsibility for historic carbon emissions. But the promise of $100 billion of climate finance by 2020 has never been met. I call on the government to face the global injustice of this climate crisis and act to tackle it. And this means providing urgent aid to Pakistan not just a mere $2 million, but a much bigger amount commensurate with Australia's historic and ongoing responsibility for the climate crisis and equivalent to the scale of the disaster. This is an issue of global justice. Aid funding and climate finance is about compensation and a debt owed for the terrible legacy of colonialism. It is not charity. It is about righting historic wrongs. And given Australia's dirty hands in producing climate changing emissions, we have a special responsibility to do everything we can for climate justice. And of course, the government must take strong, meaningful, meaningful action on climate. This means signing the Global Methane Pledge and ruling out new coal and gas projects. It is untenable to keep pouring fuel on the fire to keep sac sacrificing the lives and livelihoods of those in poorer countries to maintain the profit margins of fossil fuel conglomerates, many of whom fill political donation buckets of both the big parties. This disaster is deeply painful and deeply personal for me. I was made in Pakistan. It's where I grew up, where my elders instilled in me the spirit to stand up not just for myself, but to stand up for my community and to never stay silent in the face of injustice and unfairness. And there is no greater unfairness and no greater injustice than the climate crisis. I'll put the question, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.